McEwen. Uh, Senator Muir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to the debate on the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Bill 2016. Um, you're going to have to forgive the speed I'm going to speak because I've got a lot to say and not enough time to do it. Uh, but firstly, I'd like to um, acknowledge the ALP's contribution to this debate, um, noting the uh, possible impacts of this legislation into the, the future, and of course highlighting that even the government's made amendments at the last minute. So it goes to show how great this process has been. Um, I actually uh, commend you for your support of uh, the crossbench and, of course, the 25 per cent of voters who are um, choosing to vote outside of Labor, Labor, Liberal, Nationals, and of course the Greens, um, the instigators of all this. Um, <laughs> The election of myself is largely used as a justification for this bill being presented to the parliament. To quote some of the rhetoric, it is undemocratic that somebody can be elected on 0.51 of a percent of a quota. This is a commonly used statement. Those who preach this forget uh, that to be elected, I had to actually receive 14.5 per cent of the vote. As it turns out, I did not get elected on 479 votes below the line, nor the 17,122 vote above the line. But 483,076 votes after receiving preferences. I started gathering preferences after receiving 0.51 of a per cent. That's the common number that gets spread around. This is the exact same rules which, of which the major, major parties uh, play by and have used to their advantage for 32 years. In the current makeup of the Senate, there are 13 senators elected who received significantly less of a prim primary vote than myself. As low as 0.01 of a per cent before, before receiving preferences and ending up being elected at the required 14.5 per cent. Nobody is speaking about that, of course, because it doesn't suit the agenda. It seems that this bit of information is regularly missed out on in this debate. Why? Because it highlights exactly how the major parties and the Greens have been using this system to their advantage and pulling the wool over the eyes of the voters for 32 years. I might be called the accidental senator, but I am a duly elected Australian senator nevertheless, elected under rules that have served this country well for 32 years. What is different now is that the minor parties have figured out how to use, uh, how to use the rules the exact same way the major parties do, and have levelled the playing field by doing just that. If minor parties have been directing their, their preferences to the major parties, or the Greens, um, above other minor parties, we would not be having this debate, because they will still be the beneficiaries of the system designed by them to benefit them 32 years ago. The reality is, one in four voters have become unimpressed with the way they have been represented, or in reality, unrepresented, by the major parties and the Greens. They are looking elsewhere, and, and, and that is the only way minor parties are receiving enough votes to stay in the game. If the major parties were passed in the pub test by the voters, I will still be blissfully disenfranchised with politics while milling timber in country Victoria. I note that in Senator Back's contribution to this debate, he made some good points in relation to the need for some form of electoral reform. You see, I'm not actually saying that things need to or have to stay as they are. I am opposing the so-called reform in its current form as it strips democracy from the people and empowers certain parties. Senator Back quoted a section, quoted section 7 of the, of the Australian Constitution, which highlights that parliamentarians should be elected directly by the people. Senator Back, I agree. So where is the, ba the debate about removing above-the-line voting, which encourages party voting and internal party preferences? On Senator Back's assessment, Mr. President, of Mr. Acting, uh, Acting Deputy President, why are we not encouraging below-the-line candidate-based voting? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ignore the interjection. It was seen this would not benefit the majors, uh, so why was it not even discussed by the Joint Standing Committee into electoral matters? Either that, or, or this is more evidence that even with this so-called committee oversight, it was missed by the major party political geniuses. Just more of a reason on why I'm calling for a proper process in relation to this bill. Not just the Greens claiming that because they've been discussing a topic for 10 years, the first bill proposed should be ran through Parliament gagging important debate and oversight on the issue. This just highlights that there is something to hide and they are treating the, the, the public of Australia with contempt. However, this deal has shown how those who have opposing ideologies sometimes unite around a common cause, albeit a dirty cause uh, this time. The deal between the government and the Greens has shown how these differences of opinion are put aside to unite around a common, yet misguided view in this case, on an issue. 
So much so that the government won't discuss its own Australian uh, Building and Construction Commission legislation, which the government have been publicly saying is the most important legislation it needs to present to the parliament. More to that, the Greens have proven uh, that opposing parties will work together on common issues to the extent of opposing their own legislation in relation to marriage equality twice in one week, twice in one week, and another one of their bills to allow landholders the right to refuse gas and coal mining on their land. So much for this rubbish that when you vote for a minor party, you may get someone who doesn't have the same values as who you voted for. It appears that it's OK to vote for the Greens and get the LNP, or vote for the LNP and get the Greens. It seems the government is happy to let the Greens steer their direction while the LNP are now the ones lost in the wilderness. This deal has shown how the voters have trusted their favourite choice under the current system to make these decisions for them. These decisions for them. It has also highlighted that when their voters are gravely concerned about the nature of the process, that they are not happy to listen and push spin upon them to push their own agenda. This deal has shown how the polar opposites on political spectrum, the Conservative Coalition and once Progressive Greens, can unite over an issue. The bill, this debate, is all based around the argument about the need to remove individual and group voting tickets. Those supporting the removal of group voting tickets have followed this approach to ensure that these changes are passed in the Senate. But let's think about this for a moment. Let's consider what these parties from opposite side of politics have done. They have done the exact same thing the minor parties did with their group voting ticket negotiations at the last election. These minor parties, from opposing ideologies, united around a common cause. That cause was to save the Australian Senate, save the, save the, Senate, save the Senate from either being a rubber stamp to the government or a tool of hostile opposition for opposition's sake. Engaging minor party, engaged minor party voters agreed, with around one in four voters choosing to vote against the Coalition, Labor or the Greens. They trusted their, prefer, their preferred political party to negotiate in their interest. The voters put forward their voice. The voters wanted something different in the Senate. If you consider for a moment that the concept is around minor parties and their supporters uniting against the, against the established major, par, major parties and the Greens, then this is what the result delivered. But somehow, all of a sudden, when the established major parties and the Greens are challenged, the rules are wrong. All of a sudden, the media is, enli is enlisted to whip up voter outrage, and don't I know it? Uh, how dare minor parties pull their political ideology aside to unite? That's only allowed if you're a Liberal National Party member, Senator Xenophon, or the Greens. How dare they, pa how dare they pass their preferences amongst themselves to get political outcomes to at the expense of the established parties? So, so, what do you, so, so what do those with the most to lose do? They unite against the minor parties and independents to effectively try to wipe them out. Votes will exhaust. Same process, different deals. That's politics, it seems. The Australian, the Australian Motoring Enthusiast Party and others work within the rules, and I make no apology for that. This resulted in me be le being elected on a full quota of near half a million votes, votes not directed to any of the major parties. These are the rules the major parties were happy with, so long as their minor party cousins didn't break the ranks and continue to funnel their preferences to the majors. One thing the minor parties have done is to keep both the government and opposition accountable during this parliamentary term. They highlight the failings of both sides of politics in this House of Review. The government has, the government has to win over a diversity of views in the Senate, something that is easily possible if you negotiate and communicate. The government claims that this makes things hard for them. The government is forced to keep up the spin during the whole term rather than just at the end of it. As a result, the government is accountable during the whole parliamentary term rather than afterwards like they used to. The government has failed to be agile and has struggled to adapt. The government has struggled to understand the concept of negotiation and consultation. The fact of the matter is the government does not have a clue how to deal with the crossbench nor any desire to listen to the voices of the people. We saw that that with ex-Prime Minister Abbott, and we see that still today with Prime Minister Turnbull. I, like others, have a very high, had very high hopes that Prime Minister Turnbull actually understood. He walked, he talked a talk, but for some reason can't walk the walk unless, of course, there's a selfie involved. I don't attack like this all too often. I am generally against the political tit for tat, and I'm quite vocal about that. However, I feel justified in highlighting the failings of a government and Prime Minister who have failed to live up to expectations especially when I'm often told by members of the public how I've grown into the role and they're pleased with my performance. Now that the Prime Minister's failings are starting to show, he wants to, 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 to divert the attention away from myself and my crossbench colleagues completely by attempting to have us removed. 
He wants to do this with threats of coercion, all the things, ironically, that he seeks to remove from the construction industry. I would always rather play the ball and not the man. It's a shame the Prime Minister of this great country is not willing to do the same. I will also direct some comments towards the Greens. To their credit, they have adapted. For most of this parliament, they had simply been an irrelevant minor party opposition voting bloc on most issues. They, have begun this parliament, they, they began this parliament unwilling to compromise, unwilling to negotiate, and as a result would have rather seen children left in detention on Christmas Island. Thankfully, I was able to negotiate and have them removed, even if the process took a bit longer than what I expected. I suppose if these issues are actually resolved, it's hard for the Greens to go to an election and gather votes by promising to reach a resolution for these innocent, desperate, vulnerable people. Thank God we have a diverse crossbench. Raising false hope with, completely, with complete disregard to how it would affect those it is aimed at through emotions, which the Greens know won't get up, is a disgusting tactic that needs to be called out. What we see now, however, under the new leadership of Senator Dean Natale, is a senator who is actually willing to negotiate and play for the middle. So the Greens are now doing what minor parties have been accused of doing, that is, working with each other from opposite sides of the political spectrum. What worries me is that Senator Dean Natale is effectively trying to trick the middle ground swinging voter to vote for the Greens at the expense of their grassroots supporters, not because he actually wants to represent the middle ground, but so that the Greens might increase their power and influence. So finally, under new Green leadership, they have become able to uh, return to the table and actually become a non-government force. The price for this shift towards the middle is yet to be paid by the Greens, so we'll have to wait to see how that plays out. So let's turn to the bill itself. Simply, the bill is rushed and the bill is flawed. The bill fails to address many of the issues introduced by above-the-line voting. We have already established that this bill has been introduced to benefit political operatives rather than the people of Australia. I have highlighted many of these concerns in my 30-page dissenting committee report. I encourage voters to read it. I have publicly spoken about the token sham process which this bill is, uh, uh, in which this bill has been introduced. The below-the-line emissions from the legislation was, it seems, an intentional flaw. It was done to make it appear that, some, that the committee process actually found something. It was done so it would appear that the consultation had taken place. I think it was also done so the Greens could run around and crow about yet another fake achievement. I find it very hard to believe the seasoned politicians who put this bill together with all the legal advice that was sought when drafting the bill that this omission was not intentional. They insult our intelligence and that of all Australians, thinking that we will not fall for such an obvious trick. They will continue to insult our intelligence by thinking that Australians are unable to count to 12. Why would we accept marking one, uh, the marking of six boxes below the line to record a formal vote when the minimum is 12 is beyond me? If the, ma if the majority of Australians are not able to count to 12, we have to ask, uh, and we have to make it easier by allowing 50 per cent pass mark to uh, cast a vote, then I think that screams volumes about the various governments' leadership in education over the years. Above the line voting has turned a pure candidate uh, based system into one where people are voting for a party and not the candidate. We often hear complaints about the ballot paper and the amount of micro parties that form. Nobody is talking about how the number of independent candidates has declined over the years. Has anyone bothered to consider that these are the symptoms of the same problem? That problem is above the line voting. All the, uh, above the line voting was designed to allow for the use of group and individual voting tickets. If we are to scrap these, then perhaps we should scrap above the line altogether. All we need to do is simply make it easier to cast a formal vote. Knowing that political self-interest always wins ahead of interest of the people, I've quickly given up on this approach to reform. So how can we make this butchered system better? For a start, let's actually give all preferences back to the voter, not just the preferences exchanged between political parties. Stop saying that this is the intention of these so-called reforms publicly, but then present a bill which does, that just doesn't do this. I would also like to see the preferences exchanged within a party group go back to the voter. But if we did that, then the major parties would oppose it. Why? Because they would no longer be able to help out a mate uh, who would otherwise be a Doug candidate. That Doug candidate can uh, currently be dropped into the first spot on the ticket. For a candidate to shine above, all others, uh, above others, they would need to actually be a candidate of quality. But that would make them accountable to the voters and take power away from the party hacks and put them, uh, who put them there. Well, I say, let the people choose. They can make that choice at the ballot box by voting, by voting below the line for that candidate. The problem is that they are not going to do so unless they are encouraged to do so. There is a way to encourage this engagement between candidate and voter by encouraging below the line, below the line voting. 
We have established, however, we have established, however, that this will only be done in, if it's in their self-interest, not in the interest of the voter. We will need to make them work for their vote. This could be achieved by rotating the order of groups in the ballot paper. This system of rotation is known as the Robson rotation, and it is using the hair clerk system that exists already in some of the Australian elections. This will mean that those parachuted in by party hacks will have to get out there and work for their vote. Other candidates in other spaces of the ticket would have a fighting chance to build a strong local following and earn their seat. This, is, this encourages accountability over self-interest. I should, however, return to the issue of the rise of micro-parties and the fall of the independent candidates. Once this bill is passed, it will be impossible for any group, uh, ungrouped independent candidate to be re represented above the line. Let's consider that for a moment. Around 97 per cent of votes are cast above the line. This bill fails to allow all candidates to be represented above the line. Only group party-based candidates are available to access this pool of votes. That is, unless two independent groups stick uh, together on a ticket, then they are not able to be represented above the line. So we have just doubled the amount of candidates that will now appear below the line, and it's no wonder why people are voting above the line. To stand a chance, an independent needs to group above the line for just one available seat. In order to group together, each member of a group must gather 100 different nominators in the state they are nominated in. This is a lot of work for just one seat that will be declared via preferences. So now consider what you need to do to register a political party when you consensually nominate. You will only need to gather 500 signatures from all over the country. You can then run as many candidates as you like, in whatever state you like, without having to demonstrate any local support at all. You can be a resident of Victoria and run in Western Australia when you're in a political party. If you're in a team of two independents, you've got 200 local nominators in that state in order to run. This bill does nothing to address this. Why? Because it means that the political parties would have to work a little bit harder. If I had been invited to be part of a genuine reform process, my focus would have been on restoring accountability between the candidate and the voter. I would have sought to address the problems, all the problems that above-the-line voting has introduced into the system, not just change the rules around the ones that the established major parties, Senator Xenophon and the Greens, find to be a threat to themselves. But most importantly, I would have made the system fair again, so that small political groups didn't need to form a political party just to have a chance. I would have made sure that people stood a fair chance as independents in their own right. I would hope that any High Court challenge to this bill and perhaps above-the-line voting would consider how there, how there has been a significant shift away from candidate-based voting and, uh, to party-based voting. I would hope that these would consider how it is impossible for a single independent candidate to be directly elected by the people for the party-based voting above the line. This bill has been rushed through Parliament with little to no oversight for, no, uh, for, for a reason. It does not deliver what those who want it claim. We may well find ourselves with a rubber stamp Senate after the immediate double dissolution election, and the Greens will be the ones who have to answer for it. I am buoyant by the support I have received from across Australia over the past three weeks, from coalition supporters disappointed with the coalition, and from Green supporters bitterly disappointed with the Greens. And of course, it's not too late for the Greens to realise the error of their ways and withdraw their support for this, this ill-considered uh, ill bill. Um, yesterday, Senator Rice mentioned in her speech, uh, how, could, how will somebody who votes for the Bullet Trains for Australia or no CSG party, uh, no CSG party feel uh, with me being elected um, by the preferences? Pretty good, I suspect, considering I've been very vocal about the right to veto for farmers um, and, and uh, um, access for, to mine, for mining companies on their land. And the question hasn't been raised about a, a train from uh, Melbourne to Sydney via Canberra, but I'll tell you what, it sounds like a pretty good idea to me. And uh, <laughs> if I can come up with this debate, if I can come up with this debate and highlight clear flaws, it shows one thing: oh, Senator no. Lee Rhiannon is no longer for the grassroots green supporters who are against the political machine. She is part of that machine and allowing the, the, the minority Liberal government, who would be nobody without a coalition, uh, <laughs> to lock diversity out. If this is so important, where's the plebiscite? Why aren't the people having a chance to vote on this? Why has it been rushed? through the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, locking everybody else who might actually have an intelligent contribution to add to it out of the debate. I, I, I would have to say what the, the, the Labor Party may have just said. You are running scared. <laughs>